Uh, hi, my name's Philip from Vet Education. Welcome to the webinar this evening, this morning, in the middle of the night, depending on where you're from. It's great to see where you're all from, from all over the world. It's fantastic. This is a webinar brought to you by Hallmark. Pet that MRI, an introduction to MRI physics, and our speaker is going to be introduced in a little bit, uh, Dr. Steve Roberts. I'm just going to hand the microphone duties over now to uh, Dr. Karen Johnson, who's the Global Business Development Director in the Companion Animal section of Hallmark Veterinary Imaging. Uh, Karen, welcome to the lecture this uh, this evening, this afternoon, or I think it's this evening, isn't it, where you are based in, <laughs> based in China? So uh, I think Tourism has activated your microphone, so uh, the floor is all for yours. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Philip, and a big thank you to the two of you for being up at 2 o'clock in the morning. So we really appreciate it. Well, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all the people that have joined us today. We're very pleased that you're here and want to thank you for taking an hour out of your day, whatever time of the day it is, to join us. Um, I get the great pleasure of introducing our speaker today, who's Dr. Steve Roberts. He's the technical director at Hallmark, and as such, he has overall responsibility for both the development and the support of our Hallmark standing equine MRI, as well as the pet vet companion animal product. Steve is an award winner. He's the recipient of many awards, the three latest ones. Last year, he was awarded two Queen's Awards, as well as an Institute of Physics Award, and this he got for his work on motion correction software. Steve has about 25 years experience in MRI, so he really was one of the pioneers in veterinary MRI, and he has experience in both low, low and high field systems. But most importantly for us today is that Steve loves to teach. So he's been known to find himself on a Saturday morning in the local high school outside of London, trying to enthuse uh, high school students about science and technology. So he just, he loves to talk about this subject. So I think you'll find that um, at the end of the hour. So we have heard from many of you that MRI physics can be quite complicated, whether you're um, a resident training or whether you're in practice um, as a GP or a specialist. And that's really what prompted this webinar. And we certainly hope that at the end of the hour, you know a little bit more about it. But please give us some feedback. We aim to help you learn about this topic. And um, you know, if we put on future web webinars, we want to make sure we're pitching it to you at the right level. But I'll, for now, I'll turn it over to Steve. And he'll speak for about 50 minutes on an introduction to MRI physics. And then we'll take questions at the end. So thank you very much. And Steve, over to you. Thank you, Karen. Um, thank you for that kind introduction. And uh, welcome to everyone, wherever you are. Um, it's about 5.30 in the afternoon here, just outside London. And um, as uh, Karen said, I've, uh, I've been an MRI physicist for nearly 25 years. And uh, I did some calculations. I think during that time, I've worked on the development of about 20 different MRI scanners, most of which were unique at the time they were developed. So I certainly know a bit about MRI. And, uh, but even I'm still learning some of the subtleties of MRI physics, even all these, after all these years. But I think MRI physics, although a very complicated subject, it's important that we you know, uh, people using the MRI machines get some understanding of what's going on. So uh, this hour lecture gives us a chance for me to go through some of that. Um, I'm going to go into um, four subjects, um, four regions, and um, you should see that come up in a second, hopefully. There we go. So I've split it into four sections, uh, and there'll be a chance between each section to, um, to answer some questions. And the idea being that after these four sections, you should hopefully have a good introduction into the uh, into the how MRI systems work and the physics behind it. Um, before I start that, it is actually possible to summarize MRI in three short paragraphs. So I, I'm going to put this slide at the beginning and the end of my talk. And uh, hopefully I'll make a bit more sense towards the end. But certainly what I've done here is uh, try to highlight in bold some of the key points of these three paragraphs. So I'll read it out to you, and I'll, I'll explain a bit around it. So MRI is a non-ionizing imaging technique. What that means is it's not like X-ray and CT. We're not using things that can cause potential harm to biological tissue, where you're looking at magnetism and radio waves. It involves strong magnets, which align protons within the hydrogen nuclei of biological tissue, primarily water and fat molecules. So when people talk about imaging protons, that's true, but we're only imaging protons within the hydrogen nuclei. Radio waves are passed through the biological tissue, which cause small changes to the magnetic alignment of these protons. And this results in a very small, weak signal to be emitted. 
The signal is then received, amplified, and importantly, the phase, frequency, and amplitude of this signal is analyzed by an MRI computer to produce the image. So from these three paragraphs, pretty much summarizing all the important key parts of what goes on in an MRI scanner. And I'd say I will go back to this slide at the end. But for now, um, you can see that you know, particularly I'm going to dwell on the phase, frequency, and amplitude aspect, because that's really important to how you spatially encode the signals and produce the image. So when we talk about the origin of MRI, actually, I always like to show this slide, because um, on the left-hand side, you have the very first MR image. This was back in 1973 uh, by Peter Lauterborough and his team. Uh, also, in the same year, uh, Peter Mansfield, uh, for Paul Lauterborough, so Peter Mansfield uh, also came up with the idea of using NMR, as it was called at the time, to produce images. And in fact, you can see on the left-hand side is the very first image, which is just two tubes of water, uh, which actually were rotated inside a special magnet. And then the image on the right is actually the very first human MR image from 1977. Uh, and you can see, obviously, just about make up some detail in there. There's some kidneys at the back of the This is a slice through the abdomen of a human. But um, what's important here is the physics hasn't changed. But what has changed over the years is the computing technology, the magnets, the uh, MRI electronics, and the software that goes behind it. And so I just thought it was interesting to see how where we started from 43 years ago. And, and obviously, the images we get now are incredible. Uh, and have been for a while, actually. So when we talk about the origin of the signal, as I said in my cover slide, what we're looking at are photons inside the hydrogen nucleus. So the hydrogen nucleus is the simplest and lightest element. It contains one proton surrounded by one electron. So in the nucleus itself, we just have the one proton. And the proton itself has a property called spin. And because it also has charge, this spinning proton with charge creates what's called a magnetic moment. So you can think of a, a proton as like a little tiny spinning magnet. Now, the important thing about hydrogen is because it doesn't have any other protons or neutrons inside the nucleus, there's only this one proton, so it doesn't have any interactions with any neighbors. In other nuclei, such as helium, uh, you have two protons and two neutrons, and they actually cancel each other out. So you don't get what's called a net angular momentum or a net magnetic moment. So in hydrogen itself, with just a single proton, what happens is if you place hydrogen inside a magnetic field, the magnetic moment aligns itself with the main magnetic field. And because it has a spin, it's a bit like a, you imagine like a gyroscope or a spinning top. It processes around this magnetic field. So if you've ever seen a spinning top, it slowly moves around because it's actually being influenced by gravity when it's standing on the floor. And the same thing with these protons. They're spinning around, processing around the main magnetic field. So when we talk about proton imaging, we do detect signals from protons, but only from hydrogen. That's a kind of a key point there. And I'll go over how that happens in the next couple of slides. So if you assume you have no net magnetization, so if the protons, let's say, for example, in a cup of water, so we have our water. But if there's no main magnetic field, the protons will be randomly aligned, as you see in this first slide here. But let's say we put this cup of water into a magnet. And I've represented the magnet here with a north and south pole. And I've given an amplitude, which we call B. So in MRI physics, we always talk about the strength of a magnet. And we always refer to it as B, or sometimes B0. Um, the Earth's magnetic field um, is a lot weaker, obviously, than the MRI magnets. But we measure fields in Tesla. So the Earth's magnetic field is about 0 0.00005 teslas, whereas a lot of human MRI machines in hospitals are running at 1.5 teslas. So that's about 30,000 times stronger. So we're talking about very strong magnetic fields here. So if we place our cup of water of all these protons in the hydrogen nuclei into this magnet, a strange effect happens where the protons, because they have a net magnetic moment, they align themselves either parallel or anti-parallel to the magnetic field. And what's interesting is there is a small difference between the number of protons parallel to the number of protons anti-parallel. There's a very, very slight preference to be parallel to the magnetic field. And so what we end up with is the protons pointing parallel cancel out the protons anti-parallel, but there's a small, what we call net magnetization. So a small residual number of protons will be pointing in the parallel direction. And to give it some, uh, some numbers here, at room temperature, the difference between parallel and anti-parallel protons is about for every quarter of a million anti-parallel protons, there's a quarter of a million and one parallel protons. There's a very tiny difference. 
But importantly, this difference is what we're detecting as a net magnetization. The other things to point out here is actually, I say at room temperature, because if you, if you reduce the temperature of the sample, so if we cool this cup of water, the, the population will slightly change. Actually, there will be slightly more parallel protons than there are in this example here. So sometimes in uh, non-biological MR imaging, they actually cool the sample down because you can actually create more signal by doing that. Now, there's a lot of equations in MRI, but for this particular talk, I'm only going to show you one. It's the most important one. There's this one I just shown at the bottom there. And it's omega equals gamma B. And what that really means is omega, in this case, is the frequency of the precession. So how fast do the protons process around this magnetic field? And at 1.5 Tesla, it's 64 megahertz. So what that really means is 64 million times a second, the protons are processing around this magnetic field. Now, at a lower field magnet, say, on the standing equine, that's about 12 million times a second, but it's proportional to the field. So if we double the field, we double the frequency that the protons process at. So at 3 Tesla, it's 128 megahertz. So sometimes you hear people talking about what megahertz is your scanner. It's because that's really directly related to the strength of the magnet. And 64 megahertz is, is the frequency for a 1.5 Tesla scan scanner. And it just happens to be that 64 megahertz is in the radio wave spectrum of the ele electromagnetic spectrum. Um, as I'll explain in a minute, because what we have here is a stable system of protons processing around a magnetic field, but at the moment we have no way of producing or detecting a signal. To do that, we need to create a secondary magnetic field. So in my example here, what I have now is, again, if we have our magnet and we have the protons inside pointing either parallel or anti-parallel. And to the side of the magnet, I've actually represented two coils, one I call a transmit coil and the other one a receive coil. In some machines, like the standing equine, actually, there can be just one coil that does both. It depends on the space available inside the magnet. But certainly most clinical and veterinary MR systems will have at least two separate coils. Now, as I say, the protons are processing at 64 megahertz. So if we send in a radio wave pulse at the same frequency, and this is important, it has to be the same frequency, a radio wave is actually a time-varying magnetic field. So we have the main magnetic field pointing, in this case, in the vertical direction, north-south, as shown there. And we now introduce a secondary, smaller magnetic field from a radio wave, which is now in the horizontal direction, as I've shown it on the slide. What this does is the secondary magnetic field interacts with the magnetic moments of these protons and causes them to tip over. It's an exchange of energy. It's actually what we call a resonance. So the R in MRI resonance actually comes from this effect where the energy from the radio waves is transmitted into the protons and causes them to change their magnetic alignment. They tip over. And as they tip over away from the main magnetic field, they create a very tiny voltage, which summed together is detectable by a secondary antenna, secondary RF coil. So in the example here, I, you, you put in a very large pulse, usually of the order of kilowatts of RF power, and you detect a very tiny signal, usually of the order of microwatts, very, very tiny, incredibly small signal, but you can detect this signal. You can amplify it and send it back to the MRI computer. Importantly here, the, the maximum signal is obtained when we tip the protons over through what we call 90 degrees, so exactly perpendicular to the main magnetic field, and this produces the largest signal. So quite often you hear of people talking about 90 degree pulses. What they mean is they've tipped over the protons to produce the maximum signal at the time of RF excitation. Now what I'm going through here is actually what we call the classical description of MRI physics. Now there is, some of you may be aware that you can describe MRI physics in terms of what the quantum mechanical Quantum mechanics is fantastic if you're good at maths and you want to hear lots of equations, but it's very hard to visualize. So most people who give presentations on MRI physics talk about the classical interpretation like we see here. In the quantum mechanical interpretation, we talk about different energy levels. And actually, when you send in the RF pulse, you actually cause protons to jump to different energy levels, and they emit a photon as they relax back. But the fundamental equations are the same. So just sort of put that in clarity there. Um, the other thing is the signal that comes back, uh, if you can see, if I move this pointer over to this area here, this is the received signal, which we call an FID, which actually stands for free induction decay. It's a, it's a decaying signal from the protons. It usually lasts of the order of a few tens to hundreds of milliseconds, so it doesn't last very long, but it contains very important information about the protons. I'll explain a little bit more about that later on. 
and that's processed by the MRI computer to produce images. But again, that's a, a complex issue which I'll go through in a few later slides. But this is fundamentally um, how the MI signal is created in the first place. And uh, hopefully that makes some sense to all of you. Um, I showed you with one received coil, but it's important to also highlight that actually most MRI machines have an array of coils. This, um, this image at the top here is actually um, a 16-channel V-shaped spine coil we use on our PetVet product. There's actually 16 received coils all combined together. And the reason you do that is the smaller coils actually have higher sensitivity and pick up less noise, but they cover a small region. So by having an array of received coils, you can combine them together to produce one image, in this case, of a large dog spine. The other thing I'd like to highlight in this part of the talk is the fact there are different types of MRI magnets, um, two main types primarily now. There used to be a third, but they don't make that, that the, uh, the third version anymore. So I'll dwell on the two main types. There's the permanent magnet, like the standing equine. A permanent magnet actually uses a rare earth metal called neodymium, and that is magnetized in the factory and stays magnetized, a bit like the magnets you find on fridge doors sometimes. Um, and those blocks are placed inside a steel yoke. And this particular magnet is always on. And actually, the magnet in this drawing here, actually, this photo is actually this blue thing here. That's, it's the two poles where the horse's leg goes in the middle. Importantly here, the field goes left to right, as you see it, on this particular magnet. And a lot of permanent magnets are what's called this open design. Their field strength varies from about 0.1 Tesla up to about 0.5 Tesla, and they're sometimes known as low field scanners. It's all relative, because obviously even a 0.5 T scanner is 10,000 times stronger than the Earth's magnetic field, but relative to some other scanners, it's classified as a low field scanner. But it has many advantages in the fact that it's permanently on uh, and actually cheaper to make because it doesn't require electricity to maintain the magnetic field. The second type of uh, magnet is called superconducting. Uh, this is a quite an exotic magnet, although very common, um, there's actually a huge amount of engineering to develop these magnets. And superconductivity is a very complex physics subject, so I won't go too much into that. But what I would say is, first of all, superconducting magnets uh, are strong magnets. You go from 0.5 Tesla up to even 7 Tesla. In fact, I've actually been in a 7 Tesla magnet as a research site. Um, and you, at 7 Tesla, you can really feel the effects of the magnetic field. But to produce these super strong um, fields, they have uh, a huge amount of special wire inside these magnets. In fact, the PetVet system has 50 kilometers um, of wire, a uh, special alloy called niobium titanium. And this wire is round around certain uh, windings inside the magnet. And we cool it down to minus 269 degrees Celsius, or 4 Kelvin, so very, very cold using liquid helium. We then apply 500 amps into these thin wires. But because they have no resistance, they don't generate any heat. So superconductivity states that certain wires at certain temperatures have no resistance. So you apply this current to produce the magnetic field. The forces inside of these magnets is huge. I mean, in this particular magnet you see here, this is 100 tons of force inside the magnet. But importantly, it produces an extremely uniform magnetic field. This is the actually the pet vet magnet here um, with the self-shielding. But this particular magnet um, is a 1.5 Tesla magnet. And we calibrate the homogeneity of this magnet, we, we, get a, we want a uniform, flat magnetic field inside the magnet. And we aim for a field which is in, measured in parts per million. And to put that into some perspective, if you imagine the uniform field of this magnet as being an Olympic-sized swimming pool, then it'd be flat and only deviate by less than two millimeters over the whole surface area of the pool. So it gives you an idea that the field has been very uniform in all MR magnets to produce the images. But it's these two primary magnets used. Certainly in hospitals, a lot of magnets are the superconducting magnet. But uh, permanent magnets have a lot of applications because they can be made easily into open designs. So that is the um, first part of my first section there. So I don't know if there's any questions. Um, I don't know if there's anyone who's uh, any questions you want to relay right now. I can move on to the next subject. Hi, Steve. It's Philip here. Um, no questions have come up so far, so we might move on. And uh, if anyone does have any questions, we could pick them up later on. OK. Sounds good. OK. So the next section probably is the most challenging section to, to understand. It's, it's how we encode the signals. I've put this slide up to really um, emphasize how it is, because sometimes when you're 
someone's explaining how you spatially encode the uh, protons to produce the image, there's certain steps where it seems like a big leap takes place and, and no one's quite sure how that got from A to B. But hopefully I'll explain it in a way that makes sense to you all. Um, so to do this, I mean, the first thing to, to, uh, to produce an image, we need I say a, a uniform field, but actually to produce spatial encoding, we need to change that field in a known way. So as well as having the RF coils and the magnet coils, we have a, we have a third set of coils called gradient coils. And these are in all MR scanners. Uh, this particular pitch you see here actually is of a cylindrical gradient coil you might find in a Supercon like the pet vet. And this actually has loads of windings in there, three primary windings, which we call X, Y, and Z. And they're combined in there to allow us to change the magnetic field in a known way. So the important thing here is we, we have to change the field such that we can make the field either stronger on one side of the magnet or stronger at the top of the magnet, say, than the bottom or the front than the back. So by having coils in three orthogonal axes, we can pulse current into these coils and we can then um, change the magnetic field in a known way. I've shown got three drawings at the bottom here, which hopefully gives some idea of how that works. We always, as MRI physicists, we always define the main magnetic field in the Z direction or the Z direction, um, as you see here. And so, for, in for instance, if we say the X gradient, which conventionally is left and right on most MR scanners, if we apply a, a current into the gradient coil, the X gradient coil, we change the magnetic field such that, in this case here, as you see, the left side of the magnet is actually weaker magnetic field than the right-hand side of the magnet in a uniform known way. The Y gradient typically changes the field in the up-down direction, so we can make the magnet stronger or weaker at the top of the magnet relative to the bottom of the magnet. And in the Z direction, we can change the magnetic field such that the front or back of the magnet can be stronger than the other. So it's by changing the magnetic field in a known way, we can change the properties of the protons in different locations of the magnet. And I've got two examples to hopefully explain that in a way that makes it better to understand here. So what I've got is I'm going to go back to that very first MR image we saw at the beginning of the talk with uh, two tubes of water. And so what was going on there? And how on earth did we get some sort of image or spatial encoding from those two tubes of water? So I've got two tubes here, a blue and a gray. They're actually, they're actually identical in terms of they both contain water. I've just colored them different colors just to show you what's going on there. But let's assume we have a uniform magnetic field. So that's represented below. That's a normal uniform magnet. What happens when we then send in an RF pulse into these two tubes of water? Well, because all the protons are seeing exactly the same magnetic field, they all resonate or process at the same frequency. So what we get back is our familiar FID, this free induction decay. So it's a single frequency decaying with time, a bit like a ringing bell. Imagine this is the sound from a bell. You hit the bell, and slowly the signal decays away. This is what we get from a very uniform magnetic field regardless of what is in the magnet, all the protons will process at the same frequency if it's a perfectly uniform magnetic field. If we now take our two tubes of water, but now apply a gradient, in this case along the left-right direction, what we have now is the left side of the magnet is actually has a slightly lower magnetic field than the right-hand side of this magnet. So what that means is the protons on the left side will actually resonate or process at a slightly lower frequency than the protons at the right. And if we look at the signal coming back from that, we end up with this strange looking signal. It's actually a beating pattern. It's actually a combination of multiple frequencies in this still decaying signal, but now it looks quite different to our FID. We now have something which actually looks like a, a combination of different frequencies beating together. And this is because we've changed the magnetic field in a known way, and protons on the left are processing at a slower frequency than protons on the right. If we take our two signals, how do we then take this information and make something that's useful to us? Well, if we look at the times, this is as the data is acquired and sent to the MRI computer. We have two sets of signals here. Um, but we can do what's called a mathematical algorithm called Fourier transform. Now, a Fourier transform takes uh, a time signal and finds all the frequency components in it. So it, it changes from a time signal into a, into a frequency spectrum. So if I just show you that, hopefully it'll make some sense. But if we do a, a mathematical Fourier transform to these two signals, on the first signal here, what happens is we pick out the single frequency. All the protons are the same frequency. So when we now look at our spectrum, this is now a spectrum, we see that we have one peak that representing the frequency of the protons. 
This peak actually has a slight whip to it, but that's because we have a decaying signal, and that's a, just a consequence of a Fourier transform. But importantly, if we now look on the right-hand side, we've done the same Fourier transform to this different shaped signal, but now what we have, instead of a single peak, we actually have two peaks, uh, two broader peaks as well. And what these peaks actually represent are the two tubes of water. So the peak on the left-hand side actually represents the tube of water on the left side of the magnet, and the right-hand peak represents the tube on the right-hand side of the magnet. If we actually removed one of these tubes from the magnet and repeated the scan, we'd end up with a single peak in the position that that particular tube is located. So what we have here is actually what you say in the simplest term is a one-dimensional profile, a one-dimensional image of those two tubes of water. This is actually what we call frequency encoding, because what we've done is we've applied a gradient such that the frequency of the protons changes with position. So the protons in this location have a low frequency, the protons over here have a high frequency, and by using this Fourier transform mathematical algorithm, we can pick out these frequency components from this what looks like a random looking signal. So importantly, we've actually managed to get some spatial encoding into those two tubes of water. Now, to progress it further, to get a two-dimensional image, it's actually easy to look at a slightly more complex object. So now I've got a, 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 an object made of six blocks. Um, each block has, uh, is labeled A to, through to F, and they have different amounts of protons in them. So if you, as you see it here, block C has a, a large number of protons. So for instance, if these blocks represented six cups of water, this would be a, a full cup of water whereas A and E represent maybe a cup which is two-thirds full, and the bottom row, B, D, and F, have maybe a third of water in them. So this object represents um, six quadrants or six blocks, each with different amounts of protons in them. So how would we get spatial encoding into such an object? Well, if we don't have a gradient field, when we actually send in our RF pulse, we end up with different amplitude signals from those six blocks, but unfortunately when we acquire them and receive the signals, because they all have the same phase and the same frequency, they all arrive together and are indistinguishable. So we end up with a, 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 sig a signal which is a mixture of all the signals in these what we call voxels. And a voxel is a name we give to a 3D pixel. So if you imagine each one of these blocks is a voxel, and this represents a voxel here, each voxel has the same phase and frequency, different amplitudes, but unfortunately we can't tell the difference between each block when we receive that signal because we can, can only tell the difference between phase and frequency, as I'll explain in a second. So what we need to do now is we do need to spatially encode these, block, these blocks to actually work out the amount of protons or the, the density of protons in each block uh, and then produce a grayscale image. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to represent this real object as an image made of grayscales such that it will look something similar to the object we've actually drawn here. So we'll end up with a bright a uh, light gray scale on C, darker gray scales at the bottom row, and slightly in between on A and the E um, sections there of that, of that object. So to do that, first of all, we can apply, as we know already, we can apply a frequency encoding. So just like we did with the two tubes of water, we now have frequency encoding going, in this case, from left to right across the object. And as you can see, what's happened is actually the frequency of the blocks in the A and B sections have got less they're actually a lower frequency because they're in a, the magnetic field has reduced, so they're processing at a lower frequency. The protons in the middle blocks are actually at the same frequency because the gradient is in the middle of a magnet is, is zero. And so here we have no change in frequency. They're the same as they were before the gradient was applied. On the right-hand side of this object, we now have two blocks with higher frequencies. So we actually have spatial encoding in the left-right direction. So if we now process this the same way we did with the two tubes of water, we end up again with an interesting looking signal, but when we Fourier transform this, we try and find the frequency components inside that signal, we end up with three peaks, each peak representing a column, as you see here. So the first peak represents the signals combined from the A and B blocks. The middle peak represents the signal from the C and D blocks. And then the final peak here is from the E and F blocks. So we have got space encoding, like we did with the tubes, in the left-right direction, the frequency encoding, as we call it. So we have, again, our one-dimensional profile in a rudimentary form here. Um, but we still can't discriminate every single um, block. We can't tell you exactly how many protons are in each block or the proton density in each block. So what we need to do is we need to apply a, an extra spatial encoding element uh, along the up-down direction. 
And this is the part of MRI spatial encoding which gets quite complicated. In fact, the people that developed this won Nobel Prizes for their work. So it's, it's, not, a, it's not a simple uh, concept, but I think I'll try to explain it in a way that hopefully makes sense. What we do is we apply what we call a phase encode gradient in the vertical direction. So I've drawn it there. So we now have a, a single phase encode gradient. And what that's done is we apply that gradient, unlike the frequency encoding, we only apply it for a short duration, switch it off, and it causes the phase of the protons to change with position. So as you can see here, the signals are actually inverted. The top row uh, um, actually has signals which are inverted relative to the bottom row. The frequencies are also obviously still encoded as before from the frequency encoding, but now we have in introduced an extra level of encoding. In fact, again, if we get the signal back from that um, acquisition, the signal has changed yet again because we've now actually, instead of adding together, what happens is these signals actually cancel. So we actually have a smaller signal because A and B actually subtract, a bit like noise cancelling headphones, they're subtracting because they're opposite phase. Uh, and again, with the C and D blocks and the E and F blocks. So from this, we now have every single voxel or block has a unique phase and frequency. But before I move on, I just want to dwell a bit more on phase, because phase is sometimes a hard concept to, uh, to understand. But I, I think one good way of describing it is um, if you imagine three clocks on a wall, um, and the middle clock is very, very accurate, the clock on the left loses 10 minutes per day, and the clock on the right gains 10 minutes per day. So if we set all the clocks exactly at 12 o'clock at midday, so they're all exactly in phase, at that moment in time, all the clocks are identical. The minute hands are pointing up. If we then come back 24 hours later, the clock in the middle is back at midday again, because it's exactly accurate. The clock on the left will actually say 10 to midday, because it's lost 10 minutes. And the clock on the right will say 10 past midday because it's gained 10 minutes. So what we've introduced there is a phase difference between the minute hands. The minute hands are no longer in phase. One is 10 minutes to, one exactly at 12 o'clock, and one is at 10 minutes past. If we then waited three days in total, what we'd actually find is actually the clock on the left, the slow clock, will now say half past 11 because it would have lost 30 minutes. The clock on the right will say half past 12, and the clock in the middle will still say 12. So actually what we've introduced there is a 180 degree phase change. In other words, the clock on the left and the right are now exactly opposite with the accurate clock in the middle. And so I hope that gives you some idea of what we mean by phase. It's the direction the photons are pointing at any moment in time. So we apply our phase encode gradient, and then we switch it off, and then we hopefully can get a, a unique phase and frequency from each uh, voxel. So as you can see here, as I said earlier, each one of these voxels is now unique. Uh, they have different amplitudes, as we saw before, but now they have a unique combination of phase and frequency. And by using our Fourier transforms, we can actually pick out the signals now from each one of these six blocks. Now, hopefully, it's easy to visualize with just a simple uh, six-block uh, image here. But obviously, in MR imaging, we tend to use either 256 or 512 pixels in our images, and sometimes more as well. And to do that, what we have to do now is instead of just doing two phase encode steps, as we've seen here, we have the zero phase and a 180 degree phase, what we have to do is, for example, if we're going to do a 512 acquisition, we actually have to run 512 separate phase encode steps. So we change the phase encoding during 512 separate acquisitions. We usually go from a negative number through zero to a positive number of steps. And each time, we're changing the phase of the protons in that phase encode direction, such that we introduce what we call a rate of change of phase. That's again, that's a complicated concept, but what we're actually saying is that in different positions in that phase encode direction, the phase will change at different rates. And we can then put that into our mathematical formula, this Fourier transform, in fact, we call a 2D FFT, a two-dimensional fast Fourier transform is the exact mathematical process we use. And that picks out all the phase and frequency components from these signals and can assign different amounts of a magnitude of the signal to different pixel locations. So the important thing here in the spatial encoding is that we have to have unique phase and frequency in all the pixels. And therefore, the number of phase encode steps is dependent on how many um, pixels we want to image. Uh, typically, it's uh, 256 or 512 phase encode steps. Um, so that's what we have there. So that produces our two-dimensional image, because now we can assign each one of those unique phase and frequency signals with a position in space and allocated a grayscale, which hopefully will represent uh, the image in some way.
There is a third space encoding element which I just want to quickly talk about, and that's called slice selection. So um, what we have here, as well as producing an image, sometimes we don't want to excite all the protons in a whole object. As I've shown here, this little puppy dog, we may want to just do a slice for the dog. So what we end up doing is actually putting in a special RF pulse rather than a, a, a short pulse. We put in a longer pulse, which has a special shape. We call it a sync pulse. And what a sync pulse does, I don't need to go into all the physics behind it, but what it does is it excites just a narrow band of frequencies if the gradient is applied at the same time. So what I show here is actually on the example, we have this particular pulse will excite a narrow band of frequencies based on this gradient. And so I've shown that here by this um, grayed out here, area here. So this, only this part of the uh, animal will, be, will see the RF pulse. So only the protons in this narrow band will be excited by the RF pulse and process around that field. And therefore, we only see signals in that slice. And we can change the position of the slice by changing the frequency of this pulse. We can also change the thickness of the slice by either changing the duration of the pulse or changing the strength of this gradient. If we make this gradient stronger, we actually make the, thin, the slice thinner. If we make the RF pulse longer, we also make the slice thinner. So a combination of these pulses and gradients allow us to select a slice. And then by using phase and frequency encoding, we can then get the two-dimensional information within the object. So that's hopefully makes some sense. Um, it's quite a complicated concept, but I, again, I've got another break point here if there are any specific questions around spatial encoding, um, which I've just covered. Philip, has anyone got a question? Um, hi, no one's typed in any questions as yet, so you must be doing a superb job of explaining things there, I think, Steve. So we can pick up any questions anyone has a bit later on, if you like. OK, so uh, hopefully it's all making sense to everyone. Um, so now I'm going to move on to what I call uh, what we call relaxation. Actually, what, what I find relaxing personally is a, is a nice beach. As I put this slide here, but uh, actually in MR, when we talk about relaxation, uh, we mean something different. So a relaxation is incredibly important for another part of MR, and that's the, the ability to distinguish different tissues. So what, when we talk about relaxation and image contrast, what are we actually talking about? So fundamentally, after we send in our RF pulse. There are two relaxation mechanisms which take place simultaneously. Importantly, these things you know, happen at the same time, where the protons eventually return to their original alignment with the magnetic field. If you remember back to an early slide, we put in our RF pulse, we tip over the protons. But what happens is once the RF pulse has stopped, the protons will eventually relax back to their original state. And these two relaxation mechanisms happen, um, and they have different effects uh, and can be observed differently. And, and actually, different tissues have different properties with relaxation, as I'll cover in a minute. So if we go over what are the two relaxation mechanisms, the first one is due to imperfections within the main magnetic field. No magnetic field is perfect. As I said before, we, we do calibrate these magnets to extreme high tolerance, but they, no magnetic field is perfect. So the magnetic field plus the interactions of neighboring protons. So the protons see their neighbors, and the neighbors obviously have a magnetic field, and that magnetic field interacts with them. And what it does is it changes the phase of all the protons, depending on their neighborhood. A bit like we said with the clocks. So initially, all the protons are pointing together. But because of their neighbors and because of their magnetic field, after a very short amount of time, protons start to move and move faster, like the fast clock, or slower, like the slow clock. And they fan out, just like the minute hand I was talking about earlier, fan out in different directions. So they're not pointing in the same direction. And that causes a signal to decrease. And we call that time constant for that decay in signal. We can actually call it, officially, it's a T2 star relaxation. And because it's T2 star, because it's a combination of both the magnetic field and the neighbors that within the tissue that you're imaging. Now, if you just exclude the magnetic field, if we're just looking at the influence of the neighbors, in other words, what's in the tissue causing this dephasing, then we call that relaxation time T2 relaxation. Um, and that's quite commonly used. And when we talk about relaxation times, we often talk about T2. We don't often talk about T2 star, but uh, just for clarity, T2 star is the official decay you see. The FID, when you look at an FID, that's decaying by a rate determined by T2 stars. It's a combination of the local environment plus the magnetic field. T2 is more specific to the tissues that are actually in the magnet at the time. And as I say, different tissues have different T2 relaxation times. Whilst this fanning out, this phase coherence is, lose, is being lost, at the same time, the protons align themselves back with the main magnetic field. They point back up into the, into the main magnetic field direction. Um, and that 
the time it takes for them to recover is known as a T1 relaxation time. Uh, and again, for different tissues, T1 relaxation times vary. I'll give you some examples. In fat, for instance, fat has a short T1 and a short T2 compared to, say, CSF or water. So um, that gives us a, a good ability to be able to distinguish fat from water in MR imaging. Um, likewise, gray and white matter also have slightly uh, closer but different T1 and T2 relaxation times. The gray matter actually has a longer T1 and a shorter T2 than the white matter by a small amount. But it's these uh, differences that allow us to produce different images and different contrast. Now, just like the spatial encoding, relaxation can sometimes be a hard concept to imagine. So it's quite useful to try and find some analogy to, uh, to help explain it better. And I find one that works particularly well for me anyway is this idea of a ringing bell. Um, so I hopefully, there you go. So this bell I've drawn here, I don't know if it's coming across on the webinar or not, is actually uh, a bell that you could swing. So the bell swings and makes a sound, obviously, as, as it hits the, uh, the thing in the middle. So we have two things going on simultaneously here. So we have a swinging bell, and we have the sound from the bell. And you could say, and this is a comparison between T1 and T2 relaxation. In this case, T1 relaxation represents the swinging bell, and T2 relaxation represents the sound from the bell. And they may not be the same duration. For instance, a bell may stop ringing, but still be swinging. Um, in fact, in MR, that is actually true, that T1 is always longer than T2. So, but what it shows here is that after a certain amount of time, the bell will stop ringing and swinging and be back in its original position, pointing down due to, in this case, gravity. Um, in the case of MR, obviously, it's due to the magnetic field. So if we see that as a swinging bell representing T1, the T2 is, as I said earlier, is the sound from the bell, the ringing bell. And if you actually measure the sound from the bell, it actually looks a lot like the decaying FID signal we talked about earlier on. So again, it's quite a good analogy to say that a bell actually is quite a good representation, a good way of imagining what's going on in terms of the two things happening simultaneously. And importantly, uh, different tissues have different properties. So you can imagine like a fat is a different type of bell to a water. Uh, the water bell would ring for a long time, and, and it would take a long time to stop swinging, whereas the fat bell would stop ringing quickly and actually stop swinging quickly as well. And tissues like um, cortical bone, I mean, it's interesting. We, you know, there are hydrogen uh, atoms inside solid uh, mineral bone, but we don't ever see bone on an MR scan. And the reason being is because because it's so tightly bound, solid materials are so tightly bound that the neighboring protons are close, that their T2 is very, very short. Their interactions with their neighbors is so intense that the signal decays away. It's like having a bell that stops ringing almost immediately. So you can only image tissues when the still signal to be detected. So the signal from uh, the cortical bone actually decays away before we can acquire the signal, which is why you don't see uh, bone, solid bone on MR scans, it comes out black, uh, black pixels on the MR scans, whereas the softer bone marrow does come out brighter because it's a softer, less bound tissue which has a, a longer T2 and a longer T1. So I move on to the next slide. Um, so when we talk about image contrast, it's actually dependent on a number of things. Um, I've listed them here. These are the primary things that determine image contrast. First of all, we see the difference in proton density. What, what I mean by that, as I said, like the different cups of water, is um, if you've got a cup of water that's full compared to one that's half full, you obviously have twice as many protons in the full cup of water. Likewise, um, if you have air and water, uh, there are a tiny fraction of water protons in the, in the air vapor compared to the water um, in a cup. So proton density, the number of protons, is one way of producing contrast. The others, as I just described, are the differences in these two relaxation times, the T1 and the T2 relaxation time. And what we can do as MRI physicists and MR techs as well is we can change parameters in the image acquisition such that we can enhance different tissues based on these relaxation times and their proton density. And to do that, we actually change a number of parameters. I've listed the top three parameters you might change to produce different contrast. And these are the repetition time, the echo time, and what we call the flip angle. In other words, how far we tip the protons over. And I'll go over each one of these in turn. So if we look at these two charts here, the first of all, the one on the left, this represents what I'd call T1 relaxation weighting, where we're looking at the recovery of two tissues. In this case, I've got a short T1 tissue and a long T1 tissue, but this might be represented by fat. So the blue line could be a fat tissue, and the green line here could be like CSF in the brain, 
so a longer T1, you know, more fluid water type uh, signal. So as we know before, the, the T1 of water is longer than the T1 of fat. So as you can see, the fat signal recovers quicker into its, into its more relaxed state, pointing back at the main magnetic field. So in this chart here, we see just after about one second on this scale here, we see that there's actually a large difference between the two tissues. And this is actually the point of maximum contrast. This is when the signal from the, in this case, the CSF, is much less than the signal from the fat. And we can you take advantage of this by selecting a timing parameter around this number here, say one second, to try and maximize this difference in tissue contrast. And that would be what we call T1 weighting. So we change this repetition time to, and depending on the T1s of the tissues we're interested in, we change it to maximize the, the tissues we're interested in, dis in distinguishing. Likewise over here, this is the T2 um, decay. So now again, the fat signal has a short T2, so the signals decay faster. It's like in our bell analogy, the bell rings, the bell stops ringing faster. And this is represented by this blue line. The CSF signal, the long T2 signal, has a longer ringing bell, or lot, signal lasts longer before it dephases. So again, now we're looking at the echo time. And this is the time from the RF pulse to when we acquire our signal. We can change that time, to, again, to try and maximize the contrast between different tissues. And as you see here, around about 0.1 of a second, or 100 milliseconds, we get the maximum contrast between these two tissues. And so we can change these timing parameters to produce different images. And uh, as in any M MR, we have what we call, uh, to produce an image, we have a different, what we call pulse sequences. So a pulse sequence is, is, a, is a sequential array of, of pulses of RF and gradients to produce our image. This is a, a simple example here of a gradient echo scan. And what we're shown here is the different parameters you can change. So when we talk about repetition time, we're talking about the time between the main excitation pulses. So this time can be somewhere as short as uh, 10 or even less milliseconds and as long as maybe 3,000 milliseconds or sometimes 10,000 milliseconds, depending on the scan you're running. So the TR can change a lot. And by changing the TR, we change the contrast. The TE is the time from the pulse until the middle of our acquisition, the middle of our data acquisition, the middle of the frequency encoding, as we call it here. So then again, we can change the TE. And if we extend the TE, then we can make different tissues appear brighter than others. The other things we can change is the resolution, as I explained in our spatial encoding section. The number of phase encode steps determines um, the resolution of our image. And we can increase or decrease the number of steps and the spacing between these steps. And also, we can change the number of points we acquire, the number of frequency encoding points. Again, that changes the resolution in the frequency encoding direction. And the whole, whole sequence can be repeated a number of times. Now, as I said at the very beginning, the signals we're detecting from MR are very weak. And uh, we pick up noise. noise. RF noise comes from many sources, the resistance in the coils, uh, the preamplifiers, and the electronics. And so we're always battling to try and get the best what we call signal to noise. In other words, we're trying to maximize the amount of signal so we don't get grainy images. And some way of helping us doing that, obviously changing parameters has a big influence. One parameter which does have a big influence is the number of averages, or necks, as some people call it. And that's basically you can repeat the whole scan a number of times. And each time we repeat the scan, the signal adds more than the noise adds. In fact, it's by a square root. So if we do four averages, we actually double the signal to noise. Square root of four is two. And so we double the signal to noise. Um, so by changing this parameter, you can actually improve the image quality if that's something that's important to you. But of course, like all of these parameters, there's a trade-off of any MR parameter. So if you change any of these parameters, there's a consequence, as I'll explain in my next slide. This shows kind of a trade-off, I'd say, between different parameters. And I've highlighted in green and red where it's either a positive or a negative change. And ones I'd probably like to pick out on the field of view, in other words, how big is your image? You can change the field of view. MRI text will change MRI, the field of view sometimes for scans. And if you increase the field of view, it actually increases your signal to noise. It makes uh, there's more signal in every pixel as a consequence of doing that, which is good for the signal to noise point of view. However, it's a negative because on the resolution point of view because you decrease the resolution. And so again, a good MR physicist or MR tech will try and find the best field of view for a particular coil and body part to try and get the best resolution for the signal to noise available. And again, if we change things like the bandwidth um, of the acquisition or the matrix size, if we increase those things, we decrease the signal to noise, but we can increase the resolution or the number of slices we acquire. So this just shows here you get nothing for free in MRI, unfortunately. And uh, anyone who optimizes pulse sequences has to find out the best 
this balance point between all these different parameters to produce the image and the contrast that the, uh, the radiologist requires to uh, make a diagnosis. Now, if I take some examples of uh, different contrasts, I have um, four images. Actually, these, these are exactly the same slice. I'm not sure how well they come across over the webinar, but these are four slices um, on the PetVet system, actually, uh, through uh, the same dog brain, and different contrasts. We have a flare scan in the top left, a T2 star weighted, which is a gradient echo scan here. And we have a T1 weighted uh, spin echo and a T2 weighted fast spin echo here. And what's important is because we've got the same slice, you can really see the difference here, particularly in certain things like the CSF is dark on a T1 scan because this weights long or short T1 is brighter than long T1 on a T1 weighted scan. So cross CSF, as we have found already, as a long T1, it will appear darker than the fat signal as we see here because fat has a short T1. So T1 weighting makes the fat signal appear brighter than the fluid signal in this example here, whereas if we see on the T2 weighted, the CSF is now brighter than the fat signal because CSF has a longer T2 than the fat signal. And in the T2 weighted scan, we wait longer. We have a longer echo time to enhance the tissues with long T2s. And uh, a T2 star is, again, a similar contrast, not quite the same as some other issues, which, were, uh, which I'll talk about in a minute, and different contrast. Um, but also a flare is like an enhanced T2. It's a T2 where we've actually in suppressed uh, the fluid. It stands for fluid attenuated inversion recovery. But here it's a T2 weight scan, but the CSF is now black. We've actually deliberately suppressed the, the CSF in this scan because CSF has a known narrow T1 range. And we can actually uh, just, uh, get rid of the signals with a specific T1 by putting in an extra pulse. And these are four contrast types you might see in a typical MR scanner. There are plenty of other image contrasts you can use. There's diffusion weighting, proton density weighting, perfusion weighting, susceptibility weighting, fat suppressed. There are a number of different ways of changing the contrast. And what we're doing really as MR physicists or MR techs is we're changing parameters to try and enhance different tissues based on their relaxation types. So that's the end of the relaxation section, I hope. That made sense. And again, there's an opportunity if anyone wants to ask any questions. So uh, I'll just refer to Philip in case there are any questions that have come up from that. Hi, Steve. Yes, uh, Sarah's actually asked a question just uh, on the phase encoding that you were talking about before. And uh, she's asked the question, how does that relate to changing the phase encoding during scanning on the equine scanner? Yes, oh, that's a good question. So. Um, I think what we're referring to there is that you can actually change the direction of phase encoding. So um, typically, whoever sets up the scan, the MR physicist, will set up the phase encoding direction dependent on the number of factors. And, and it's de determined by things like different artifacts will appear in different directions. So for example, uh, blood flow. A blood flow artifact is actually a motion artifact. It's moving protons within the slice during the scan. And what that causes, the moving protons actually get misplaced on the image. So when we're using our gradients, we don't get a true representation of where the blood protons are located because they're moving during the scan, and we don't want moving objects. So what happens is the blood flow will actually smear along the phase encode direction. If for some reason that blood flow artifact is in the phase encode direction is interfering with a structure that is very important to your diagnosis, what you can do is you can change the direction. So for example, if we had the phase encoding going left and right, the blood flow artifact will go left and right on the image. If we switch the phase encoding, we can make it so the phase encoding is vertical, such that the blood flow goes vertical, and then the frequency encoding will be going horizontal. Now, that sounds like a really good idea, and it is, and it has some, a lot of applications for minimizing artifacts. And certainly, motion is an artifact which really shows up along the phase encode direction. But there are artifacts that show up along the frequency encoding direction. And the obvious one, certainly people using high field scanners, is um, when you get a fat separation, a chemical shift, the, um, the fat signal actually resonates at a slightly different frequency and actually shifts by one or two pixels sometimes in the frequency encoding direction. So again, if this frequency, this chemical shift artifact is causing issues, you can change the phase encode direction so the chemical shift goes in a different direction. So it's, depending on what artifacts you're trying to suppress, you will change the phase encode direction. And the MR physicist will try and set up what they think is the appropriate phase encode direction for any particular body part and contrast. But it, the operators can change that depending on what's happening during that scan. 
Um, and also things like wraparound, which I won't go into now, but there are certain artifacts in phase encoding which don't occur in frequency coding. So sometimes you get signals that wrap around from the outside back into the ob object. And again, by changing the phase encode, you can reduce or at least move those artifacts away from areas that you're interested in. So I hope that uh, answers that question. Great. Thank you. Uh, uh, Kristen has asked the question. She's just not sure be, if it will be covered later, but uh, she's just wondering if you'd be able to comment on J coupling for fat signal changes on FSC versus SE pulses. I think you touched on that a little bit already, but uh, yeah. I think you've also got something in the webinar coming up as well. I can, yeah, I, I can touch on that. I won't go. So this is an introductory course, so I won't go too much into it. It's an interesting point that actually does change the contrast of fast spin echo. So as I said before, the fat signal actually has a, a short T1 and a short T2. So on a normal spin echo, actually, the fat signal appears quite dark. But if, if I, actually, maybe I'll go back to that um, fast spin echo. So if you, if you notice here, the, the, the fat signal on this T2 star weighted is actually dark. You can't actually see it. It's black up here. But the fat signal on a, a T2 weighted is actually still visible and still quite bright. And that's kind of unusual because you would think, okay, well, fat's supposed to have a short T2, so surely that should be dark like on the T2 star weighted. But actually, in fast spin echo, there's a, an extra effect that's going on. This is, this is what's called JJ coupling, which I won't go into the physics of, but what it basically means is it enhances the T2 of the fat signal such because of we're putting in multiple RF pulses. On a spin echo, we use two RF pulses, which I'll explain in a minute, actually. But on a fast spin echo, we use a train of RF pulses, sometimes as many as 16 or 32 RF pulses. And that train of RF pulses actually changes the properties of the fat signal such that it changes their relaxation time um, and enhances the signal. So you end up with a brighter fat signal on a fast spin echo than you would on a spin echo. And that's one way, if you look at a T2 weighted scan, if you want to know, was it a fast spin echo or a spin echo acquisition, the, the, the level of fat signal actually is one is good indication for which one it is. Um, say bright fat on a fast spin echo because of this J, J coupling. I hope that answers that one, but I won't go into too much more detail because it does get quite complex after this and how why that is. No worries. Thank you so much for taking the time to answer that. Uh, there aren't any more questions at the moment, so we can move on and pick up some more later on. Good. Okay. Well, I hope you're all still with me on this. Um, I've got one more section. It's actually a, the shortest section, but I, I think it's certainly worth pointing out because given we have, as I saw from the survey, a number of people using the standing equine, uh, the lower field system, and we've got people using the high field systems. Those, um, I wanted to talk a little bit about the differences between gradient echo and spin echo. Um, now, the reason I, I say this is because actually gradient echo is, is used quite a lot in uh, low field scanners. There's a lot of reasons for it because the, the, actually the relaxation times, particularly T1, is actually dependent not on just the tissues. It's actually also dependent on the strength of the magnet. The T1 actually does change a lot with the strength of the magnet. The T2 doesn't change much at all with the strength of the magnet, but the T1 does. Um, it actually gets longer with a stronger magnet. So uh, there are some reasons why a gradient echo actually gives you better contrast at low field than it does at high field and why you might want to use gradient echo. So I've listed a couple of examples of the differences between a gradient echo and a spin echo, and I'll also explain how gradient echo and spin echo work. And I've got a what I've used before, which I think is a really good way of ex explaining um, how the fast spin echo compensates for the magnetic field. So when we look at a gradient echo, what are we talking about? It's actually, well, gradient echoes are usually faster scans. There are, there are, there are fewer events, there are fewer gradient events, fewer RF events. So actually, it's less sensitive to patient motion. So particularly if you're scanning something like a standing horse, then actually uh, being less sensitive to motion is a big plus. So gradient echo has a real bonus for that. On the downside, it's very sensitive to the magnetic field. It has what you call signal dropouts. I'll explain why that is in a minute, um, but that's certainly something to be aware of. It also has a thing called a fat water cancellation artifact, and that's again, like I said earlier, with the chemical shift, because the fat and the water protons process at a very slightly different frequency, just like this phase I was talking about before, the phase can cancel out, such the phase of the fat and water signals can be 180 degrees opposite, and therefore they actually the signals subtract instead of adding, and you actually get these enhanced black lines in gradient echo scans, and that's called a fat water cancellation artifact. And that's common in gradient echoes. It doesn't happen in fast spin echoes or spin echoes. The other thing is just to be aware that gradient echoes, because they don't have a true T2 contrast, and they are actually kind of a mixture of T1 and T2 contrast, they're actually, uh, certainly a lot of radiologists find them slightly more complicated. They're a more complex mixture of contrast. Something to be aware of. So I say they definitely have uh, their place in MR imaging 
um, particularly on low field scanners, but even in high field scanners, they because they're fast, you can use them for 3D imaging, and even a lot of pilot scout scans use gradient echoes because they're fast. Um, if we look at the fast spin echo and the spin echoes relative to the gradient echoes, they are they are relatively insensitive to these magnetic field distortions, and uh, they give a truer T2 contour. I'll, start, I'll explain that in a minute. They're less prone generally to image artifacts, although that's not true when it comes to motion. But they certainly have uh, other artifacts which you do not see in fast spin echo, particularly as fat water cancellation artifacts. And the contrast is much probably easier to interpret from a radiologist's point of view. The more truer weighted contrast, T1 or a T2 scan, has much more of a, a conventional weighting in the image uh, than a mixture of weightings. And therefore, they certainly have an advantage in that. But they do take longer to scan, and they are, as I said, more sensitive to patient motion. So let's explain a bit about the differences in terms of the physics behind what's going on in a gradient echo and a fast spin echo or a spin echo. First of all, what do we mean by the word echo? Well, I've already described the fact that when you excite the protons, you get this decay, this decaying bell sound, the FID, the free induction decay, as you see here. But actually, to, to get good space encoding, it's actually quite useful to produce what we call an echo. And in the simplest form, an echo is just a back-to-back -back FID. So we we dephase the signal such that they rephase to form an echo and dephase again. So imagine this is a two FIDs back to back, which forms an echo. And the advantage here is we've actually doubled the duration of the signal. Instead of having a signal lasting only this long, we now have a signal that lasts twice as long because we've actually produced an echo. And how do we produce that echo? Well, that's different depending on the different scan type. In a gradient echo scan, we actually use the frequency encoding, that we're also known as the read grade. Now, I didn't point that out earlier. Some people call the frequency encoding read. So that's just something to be aware of. It's exactly the same thing. When someone says read, they just mean a frequency encoding. And if they say phase, they mean phase encoding. So on this read gradient, this frequency encoding gradient, we actually, as you see from here, we have a negative pulse followed by a positive pulse. And what happens is this negative pulse dephases the spins, and the positive pulse rephases them into an echo which is why we call it a gradient echo, because we're actually using the gradient to form this echo. So one way of explaining how this works, and then also explaining some of the pitfalls, maybe, of, of gradient echo in terms of magnetic field homogeneity, I've actually created two examples. And this one, the first one is called, uh, the, I call it the gradient echo derby. And what it is is it's a simple horse race with three horses. And this represents, these three horses represent protons in three different parts of the magnet. So if we apply these, these gradients, the negative pulse and then the positive pulse on this running track here, this represents the changing in the field due to the gradient. So we have our three sets of protons represented by these three different horses. But because no magnet is perfect, I've also added on this, um, on this uh, running track some dirt and mud on one side of the track, such that the, the horse, the brown horse here, is going to have a tougher time running the race because he's got a slightly different surface representing a different part of the magnet, which may not be as uniform as this part of the magnet here. So what happens then if we send in our RF pulse represented by the starter gun here? The horses start running, and after, and after a time, the horse represented down here uh, by the brown horse here is actually going slightly slower because of this inhomogeneity in the track, representing the inhomogeneity in the magnet, such that by the end of the gradient event, all the horses do not finish the race at the same time. In other words, they're out of phase. We have these two horses are in phase. This horse is slightly out of phase. And the amount of out of phase depends on how bad or how inhomogeneous this track is. So this is a potential pitfall with gradient echo, is that the more inhomogeneous the magnet, the more out of phase your signals can be after these gradient events. So that's just something to be aware of. And hopefully that explains a little bit how that happens. And especially when I show you the 180 degree um, from a spin echo, you'll explain, I'll explain why it's different in a spin echo. So what I have here, again, we have our decaying signal with FID, and I have another echo again in this spin echo example. But the difference being here is instead of using the gradient to create this echo, we actually use an, an extra RF pulse. This is called the 180 degree or refocusing RF pulse. And if you look at it, it's usually about twice the amplitude of the excitation pulse here. And in a spin echo, you tend to use a 90 degree pulse. In gradient echoes, you can use flip angles that are lower than 90 degrees, maybe even 10 or 45 degrees, again, to change contrast and allow the scans to run faster. But in spin echoes and fast spin echoes, you tend to use a 90 degree pulse and 180 degree pulses. And what these pulses do is create an echo by changing or flipping, inverting the, the, the spins of the protons. And I'll show you that again now in my second example, which I call 
the gradient echo derby. The other thing to point out again is now instead of having a negative gradient followed by a positive gradient, we actually have two positive gradients in the spin echo and fast spin echo. So if we go back to our derby, now we have what we call the spin echo derby. So again, we have our three horses again. And this time I'm going to modify the track based on the first gradient pulse, the positive gradient pulse. And again, the, um, I'm going to introduce some inhomogeneity in this magnet. So the poor brown horse here is representing part of the magnet, which isn't very homogeneous for some reason. And um, then we're going to see what happens when we send in our 90 degree pulse, represented by this gun. The horses start running, representing the, the protons processing. And then by the end of this first gradient event, all the protons are dephased. What's important is you see that the, the protons represented by the brown horse over here is actually a long way behind the gray and the black horse. So this is similar to what we saw in the gradient echo, but what can we do about it? Well, we add this second, this refocusing 180 degree pulse. So a second pulse. And what that does, it actually causes the protons to invert, to flip around, represented here by the horses flipping around. So now we have the horses pointing in a different direction. And actually, as a consequence, I've now changed the finish line to over here. It's actually to where they started. The protons are now going in a different direction. They're going to complete the race. But the question now, of course, is which horse is going to win the race? And I think, I hope most of you will better work out that even though this horse is a massive head start, it has a tougher task. First of all, it has a longer bit of track to run, but also it has uh, a, a compromised track due to this um, inhomogeneity. So as we watch these horses complete the race, we see that the horses all finish the race at the same time. And this is really saying that on a spin echo, no matter what inhomogeneity you have, if you invert the spins, uh, the protons that were slowed down or sped up by this homogeneity will see the same effect in reverse going back and therefore will be back in phase. It's almost like having the clocks, the three clocks, and then uh, switching them around so the slow clock becomes the fast clock and vice versa, and eventually they'll go back in phase again and say the right time again. So this is the same thing here. Hopefully this is a, a bit of fun really, but the spin echo derby I always think is a good way of, of explaining how a spin echo is different to a grain echo in terms of compensating for magnetic field in homogeneity. So if I go back to my original slide, actually right at the end of my talk now, so I have, thank you for bearing with me. Um, I want to go back to this because, again, I said by the time I finish my talk, I hope this slide makes a bit more sense. So again, it, with, just to reemphasize some of the points, and if, you, if, if nothing else you remember this one slide, then with these three paragraphs, then it'll actually be useful information because really that's the fundamentals of MR imaging, is we're imaging protons, but only protons, in the hydrogen nuclei, and they're primarily in fat and water molecules and biological tissue. Um, we pass radio waves, they say, because these protons process at a frequency that happens to be in the radio wave spectrum, we pass radio waves, which produces a secondary field, which changes the magnetic alignment and produces a weak signal from these protons, an incredibly weak signal, and we're very fortunate we can actually pick it up and, and amplify it to produce anything useful. Um, and then we take that signal and we measure the amplitude, phase, and frequency of these signals such that we can produce a detailed image using Fourier transforms. Um, as I explained earlier. So again, thank you for bearing with me. Please remember this one slide, if nothing else, and hopefully you found some useful things in there. And I just want to say thank you for your time. I, obviously, I'm around to answer some, some more questions. But I just want to point out, that, you know, as I said at the beginning, MRI physics is incredibly complicated. You don't need to know all of it. I, so I've been working in MRI for 25 years, and even I don't know all of it. Um, these are some of the equations which actually describe mathematically what I've been talking about. But again, you don't need to know that. There are physicists and engineers that have to worry about that stuff. What you need to worry about as techs or as um, radio radiologists is, is how best to use the MR, how to interpret around image artifacts, how to select the optimal parameters, and, and appreciate that how MRI works compared to other modalities. It's, it sometimes seems similar to CT, but actually works in an incredibly different way. Um, and in my opinion, a much more complex way. Um, but it's uh, again, it's a very exciting and interesting modality. I've, I was, uh, I did, I did a physics degree, and I, MRI was one of the modules, and I uh, immediately fell in love with MRI. And I decided that was the point where I was going to spend my career working in MRI. I just loved the application. I love the fact that it involves so many different bits of physics, it involves uh, quantum mechanics, as I talked on earlier, it involves RF technology, computing technology superconductivity even. It's an incredibly interesting field, and I'm so glad that you've all taken time to show uh, some interest and listen to a bit about that. So um, that's where I finish, and I'm happy to answer some more questions, but um, thank you for your time. <laughs>
Well, thank you so much, uh, Steve, for a fantastic talk. Extremely interesting, and I think that's uh, reflected in all of the comments that are coming through. Uh, we can actually give, believe it or not, we can actually give Dr. Steve Roberts a huge round of virtual applause. Everyone, if you'd like to find a little person with their arm raised at the top of the screen, there's a down arrow next to that person. Click on that and find a pair of hands and give Steve a huge round of virtual applause. On behalf of uh, Bed Education, and Hallmark would like to thank you all for coming along today. Thank you to Hallmark Veterinary Imaging and Dr. Steve Roberts and Dr. Karen Johnson for bringing you this webinar. Fantastic opportunity to learn about an exceptionally interesting topic. And thank you so much to uh, Steve for uh, giving so generously of your time and uh, the clarity of your explanations was outstanding. And thank you again, everybody, for coming along. And thank you so much, Steve, uh, for your lecture and for Dr. Karen Johnson as well from Hallmark Veterinary Imaging. Cheers and uh, good evening.